The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished, I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And at this time, all children, grades two and younger, can go with Miss Heather for children's time. This past Tuesday, I heard at our pastor's and deacon's Bible study a story about a confirmation student that one pastor had the joy of accompanying on their faith journey. This confirmation student went through the conversations on the program and ended up having a lot of questions at the end of it. Welcome to the club. That's the walk of faith, isn't it? And the questions were specifically, what does it mean that God is a triune God? That God is three in one and one in three, Father, Spirit, Son, co-eternal, co-equal, insert other philosophical, theological words here. What does that mean? In fact, the deeper question really was, is this for real? After continuing to wrestle with these questions together, the whole group first leaned into the sense that the Trinity is a mystery that we cannot fully grasp in its entirety because God is, well, the God of the whole entire universe, and we are, well, people on this third rock from one sun amongst billions of other suns, right? With all of this, the confirmation student found that they just could not handle the mystery and decided that this Christian faith thing was not for them and decided to put it on the shelf for a while. Spoiler alert, God continued to work on their heart, and they rediscovered God's never-ending embrace of them, questions and all, and eventually answered a call to become a pastor. God does indeed work in mysterious ways. Yet we see how they had once felt that they had to have it all together if they were really going to dwell with this faith thing and could not see a way forward at the time with these questions resting on their hearts. Dear ones, we often have a hard time with mystery, don't we? Mystery can scare us. Mystery can even paralyze us sometimes. Us humans have always wanted to be able to fully understand and thus feel like we can have some semblance of control over everything. So this claim has always been true to a point because control and mystery do not really go hand in hand in our minds. However, in a world where we are always just a Google search away from whatever factoid seems so pressing in that particular moment in time, we find that our tolerance for grappling with mystery has plummeted even more over the years. 
We are so used to seeing problems or questions resolved in the span of a 20-minute sitcom episode or in a quick search on our phones that our ability to sit in the unknowing and ambiguity of the moment has all but disappeared in society. I think this development is part of the reason for so many of our social ills today, as our cravings for finding bite-sized answers through lightning-fast problem-solving have skyrocketed, so too has our ability to wrestle with the complexities of life and life-giving ways disappeared <clears throat> from the picture. It takes time to have dialogue with someone from across the political aisle to see their view and the potential merits of it and why it is valuable to them instead of writing them off immediately because we have been trained for such filtering by our lightning fast society. It takes courage to take several moments to ponder and discuss how our actions and practices we have been living out may have some flaws or shortcomings even with the best of intentions. It takes a willingness to sit in mystery to build understanding and love for someone who may not see the world in exactly the same way that we do. Plot twist, no one sees the world exactly as we do individually. And this world is in desperate need for such bridge building. And sadly, the systems we have created do not seem to give us what we need to make such connections possible. Sitting in mystery while essential to so many life-giving practices has become a privilege at best and utterly foreign and frightening at worst. Beloved children of God, behold this vision for our lives for today. The Lord our God accompanies us amidst all the mystery on this journey. The one who sits on the throne meets us amidst all the fog that's around us. Our God who reigns above the fog transforms mystery from something to fear into a gift for our sake, for the sake of our relationship with the God who loves us so very much and for the sake of our relationship with the world. In the reading from the prophet Isaiah, we are treated to the prophet's call story. It opens with the verse, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. That first part places Isaiah's call story that took place within a vision amidst a historical moment in ancient Israel's history where there was so much anxiety about the present and the future. Over the preceding years, Israel had had a great deal of transitions in leadership as different kings and their children had been warring with each other over who would have control over the community. Additionally, the different kings had different perspectives on how to best relate with the empires next door and whether they should follow the lead of the Lord their God. So there was a lot of shifting in several key areas of life in the span of a few generations, creating a community that was deeply anxious and tied up, not only about what was happening now, but what was to come in the future. As we continue through yet another election year that is being billed as the cage match of the century, and as we are being bombarded with news about how artificial intelligence is going to change every facet of our lives, I think we can relate at least a little bit with where Isaiah and the Israelites are when God offers him, and thus all who Isaiah ministers to, a vision that works to clarify things. Amidst all this chaos where it can feel like there is no place to root ourselves and thus no place to find refuge amidst the fog, God provides each of us with this vision of who is really on throne. A God who is so big and mighty and wonderful and marvelous and set apart that only the hem, the outer edge of God's clothing can fit into the temple. And this temple was the social and religious center of Jewish life in those days. Only the hem of his clothing could fit in. Not even God's pinky toe made an appearance here. God is presented as a God who is so big and vast and powerful and unique and mysterious in this narrative as these strange creatures sing in booming, echoing voices, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And this all happens in a room full of smoke, another symbol of holiness in those days. And this all causes a realization to come over Isaiah. He reacts to the wonder of the moment by saying, Woe is me, 
I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This encounter with the divine is not a moment for leaping for joy, for him at least. But Isaiah instead realizes just how wondrous God is. And by extension, he realizes how not wondrous he is and the people in his vicinity are. Isaiah is overcome by the mystery that designates God as set apart and beyond us and cries out, woe is me. Or perhaps better put, nothing good can come from this for me. I am unworthy and I am in danger even. And yet God's story does not go that way. Instead, one of the strange creatures called a seraph at God's direction goes forth and closes the gap by taking a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched Isaiah's mouth with the live coal, and the seraph proclaims that whatever has been separating Isaiah from the wonder and love of God has been removed solely by the grace of God. Then there is this call to action that immediately follows such purification and reconciliation. As the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah immediately responds with, here am I, send me. We see here that God did not allow the mystery of the moment to cause the self-imposed wedge between Isaiah and God to continue. And instead, use the realization that Isaiah had received the mystery as the first step for God-given reconciliation. In a turn that can only be possible by the mysterious grace of God alone, Isaiah has gone from woe is me to send me. Here I am. Let me be a part of this. Please send me, Isaiah says. This is not unlike what happens each week in our worship where we are empowered by the God who reigns over all to confess our sins and receive God's restorative forgiveness that mysteriously, wondrously frees us from our sin and frees us for new life. This transformation is the power of the one who sits on the throne in action no matter what chaos surrounds us. Even amidst the confusion of the time that we live in, where we may wonder how God can change Isaiah's attitude so drastically through a smoldering coal accompanied with words of grace, or how God can make a difference through us in this speedy autopilot world. Even amidst all these questions, we are accompanied by the God who keeps the Lord's promises, who continues to travel with us and will continue to guide us through the fog, even if This fog may not fully disappear until we see God face to face in the age to come. In fact, the more we spend time in relationship with the God of the whole universe and in connection to this complex, beautiful, mysterious, interconnected world, the more we will inevitably encounter that there is so much mystery in our midst. The word of the Lord for us today is that such mystery is not the end of the journey. By the grace of God who reigns over us and guides us, mystery can instead be the beginning of the deepening of the relationship we share with God. It can be the beginning of the recalibration of our ways from quick fixes to intentional engagement that truly makes a life-giving difference. The mystery that is inseparable from the life that we live has, can, and will be used by the Lord our God to draw us closer to God and to help us approach one another with increased reverence and honor that rebuilds bridges one step and one brick at a time. This Trinity Sunday serves as the first Sunday in the season after Pentecost, and I think it is perfectly timed to set us up for the weeks to come. The season after Pentecost is the season where we are invited to continue following God into new growth and new wonder for the sake of this world that God so loved. Today, in all of our readings, we are confronted with the truth that we, that there are just things that we will not fully get now and perhaps will never fully understand about the world or about the God that we are invited to worship even. As limited creatures, so much is beyond our realm of completely understanding or controlling or fixing on our own. And yet this Trinity Sunday reminds us that our triune God doesn't really care 
about such shortcomings. In fact, our triune God works through such mystery to bring new life into our bones. As the Spirit blows where it chooses, we are adopted as children of God. Even amidst all the questions we may still have, Jesus continually works with us to reveal the heart of God to us, sharing with us the truth that this whole world is beloved in God's eyes, and that Jesus would be willing to live in such a radically loving way for its sake, that he would die for its sake. God the Creator still welcomes everyday saints and sinners like Isaiah, like you, like me, in moments of worship and mystery and to be empowered to be a part of God's work in this world. As we continue through the weeks to come, we can be sure that new questions will arise, new worries probably will surface, new mysteries may enter into our view. Even so, may we follow Isaiah's lead, receiving the gifts of God in the midst of our present situation and following God even into the fog. Wonder and renewal awaits us in this world along the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.